I'd like to introduce you now to Chapter 5 of our book, and uh, Lecture 5 on our integumentary system. And now we're looking at our first organ system and we're going to bring into play some of the um, information we've covered now in the first four chapters and actually apply it to an actual organ system. So when we look at the integumentary system, and that's kind of gross, but I mean, it gives you an idea of what the skin looks like without the rest of us, is um, the integumentary system contains one of the largest organs, which is your actual skin, because the skin is just one part of the integumentary system. And what we mean by largest, it has a great surface area and great size, uh, uh, followed by the digestive system and eventually the respiratory system. The skin itself makes up about on average, you know, I mean, that's trivia, but 7% of your uh, approximate body weight. And then, of course, it's associated with other components, too, uh, the hair, nails, and glands we're going to see as we go on. So the integumentary system is an organ system, the skin itself being one organ. Now, we're going to first look at the functions of, of the integumentary system before we get into actual anatomy. So the integumentary system is your body's primary barrier. And it's also called an a, a, a innate immunity barrier. That means it, it, it's the first thing that's there before anything can get into the body. Uh, and that includes uh, chemicals, environmental change, or infectious agents. So part of its protection is to be a barrier. And there are three types of barriers. Uh, one barrier is a chemical barrier. It means it prevents um, uh, damage from uh, um, acids and bases that tend to be very moderate. Of course, strong acids and bases will eventually eat their way in. And this chemical barrier is partially due to uh, uh, lipids and proteins in your skin that, that um, you know, uh, prevent much damage. It also prevents us from damage from uh, um, microbial activity and fungal activity to a certain limit. The skin is also a physical barrier. That means it literally blocks things from getting in and out, particularly water and anything that's dissolved in water, particularly salt and whatever. So it prevents you from dehydrating. It keeps water in. It also uh, keeps water from uh, um, getting in. So, and it also prevents the free flow of salts and other materials through the underlying tissues. Um, some limited penetration of materials is allowed through, particularly lipid soluble stuff so like gasoline and uh, resins and uh, solvents and even poison ivy oils and other things um, can get in and out of the skin with some limited success. But again, you have this barrier of cells that, that physically protects us. And then the skin is also a biological barrier. It contains um, what are called these dendritic cells, okay, and also uh, um, it, 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 uh, it contains uh, microorganisms on it that actually inhabit your skin or encourage to inhabit your skin, okay. The skin also regulates body temperature. It's another very important function, and it does this by um, regulating blood flow throughout the skin and also by allowing us to sweat or not sweat. Uh, and also the skin helps to detect temperature too as part of our temperature regulatory system. It gives us cutaneous sensations. That means it allows us to detect outside temperature. It allows us to feel touch and also to feel pain. And these are two separate uh, uh, receptors we're gonna see. The skin does have metabolic functions. It helps with the production of vitamin D, okay, usually with exposure to sunlight, and this varies, um, you know, based on skin color, based on uh, um, uh, diet, okay. It also allows for the chemical conversion of things that flow in the blood of, this, of the skin. And this can be in a negative sense because certain components in your foods and certain toxins can be actually turned into uh, carcinogens, cancer causing agents in the skin. And the skin is also capable of producing hormones. Um, the skin is a blood reservoir. 
the blood vessels in the skin, particularly when you see in the um, lower part of the dermis, could retain about 5% of the body's blood. And it uses this blood primarily for body temperature regulation. And the skin also carries out the same type of excretion that kidneys do. So it can remove nitrogenous waste, that means those waste due particularly to proteins and nucleic acids in the diet, and it can get rid of excess salts, okay, usually through sweat or sometimes through glands that are found in the uh, hair follicles too. So this is a major source of getting rid of waste, particularly chemicals called xenobiotics that are found in foods. And this is sometimes why your sweat will smell sometimes like molecules that you eat. Okay, as we start getting into the structure of the skin now, the skin itself is called the integument. The system is called the integumentary system. Now, the integument is going to be composed of three regions, what's called a superficial region, that means the outermost region called the epidermis, which means upon the skin itself, because dermis is another term for skin. There's the medial or middle region called the actual dermis or true skin. And then there's a hypodermis, which the term like hypodermic needle comes from. This means that this is the region that's actually underneath the skin. Okay, it is not part of the dermis or epidermis, it is actually part of a large region called the fascia or fascia, depending on how you've learned to pronounce it. So this region called the hypodermis, which you'll sometimes see in slides, okay, is also called superficial fascia and is the, it is the true lower layer of skin. Okay, we're going to see in the hypodermis a little layer, it sometimes overlies a, a subcutaneous layer and also is composed of typically adipose tissue. So looking at these layers, we can see the um, epidermis, which sometimes is pushed down into lower layers, particularly with modifications like the hair follicles and hair, which is actually, this is an, an, uh, an organ in itself. Okay, we can see now the um, dermis right here, goes down to right about here, and you can see in the dermis, you're going to find all sorts of stuff. This is going to be connective tissue. This is epithelium. As you get down, you'll see the blood vessels, and then right as we get about here, where you see this, this fat layer, this is your superficial fascia. So, and, and this is going to be, again, connective tissue, mostly adipose connective tissue. So, to look at the epidermis in detail, what the epidermis is, it's, a, it's what we call a, str a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So, remember, squamous cells from the top look like little eggs. There's the nucleus. And from the side, they kind of look like this. They look like, a, you know, a scrambled egg, again, from a transverse view. So in most of the pictures we're going to see, we're going to look at the skin from the transverse or side view. Keratin, we're going to see, is a protein that gives the skin its protective properties. And so also the stratification of these squamous cells gives us protective properties too. So when we look at the cells of the epidermis, there are several types of cells that are commonly found in the epidermis. And sometimes other cells get in there due to special functions. So there's the keratinocytes or keratinocytes, depending again how you want to pronounce that. Those cells internally produce fibrous protein called keratin, and we're going to see what keratin does a little later. Another group of cells that are found, the second most common cells are called melanocytes, and almost all people contain melanocytes. This is that some of you, based on literally about uh, um, four to six sets of genes, have little switches for melanocytes that are either switched on or off. And if a lot of your melanocytes are switched off, you will have very light skin because melanocytes produce the, spin, uh, the pigment called melanin. It's a brown colored protein that makes the skin look darker. So let's say if you have 12 uh, uh, of the genes that make your melanocytes switch off, your skin would be as pale as this and you probably won't, sun, you won't suntan. You will probably burn. Now, if your skin is real, real dark, okay, that means that all of your melanin genes are turned on. And some people genetically just don't produce melanin at all, so there's nothing to 
secrete from the melanocytes, or they just produce very little melanin overall. In the case of albinos or albinos, they can't produce melanin at all if, you know, sometimes they'll produce a little and their skin is very, very white no matter what their genetic history is. So melanin, usually what it does is it protects us from ultraviolet light and also reduces heat penetration from light entering the skin. So it protects the light from heat and it protects the, this, uh, um, and it protects the skin from ultra, particularly ultraviolet light, but not 100% so. Now, there's also some cells called dendritic cells or Langerhans uh, cells. Langerhans is the name of the person that, that discovered these cells. These are white blood cells that form your primary immune barrier. Macrophages are found all over the body, but different ones in different regions of the body have very specific functions that may be actually different in themselves. So the Langerhorn cells are there to detect materials that, can that are trying to penetrate the skin, either by entering the skin through, through uh, s sweat glands or through the hair follicles or through damage to the skin. So they're the thing that sees damage occurring. And they're also responsible for when you have contact allergies, like contact dermatitis or irritants that affect the skin. It's the macrophages that set off that. When we talked about the healing process, the macrophages are there to start that inflammatory response that initiates healing. And another group of cells we find in the epidermis are what are called Merkel cells or touch receptors. So these are what allow you to feel very fine touch, that means sensitive touch, because we're going to learn later there are deeper receptors. We also find pain receptors a little lower down in the epidermis too. So uh, so gentle touch is what uh, allows you to be able to pick up things without crunching them and feel slight little things brushing against the skin. So now let us look at this epidermis, which is basically stratified squamous epithelium. So to understand the um, epidermis, first of all, you know, how we classify these layers varies from uh, person to person. And, and it also varies on where the skin is found and, and the environmental impacts on those skins. So some people have four layers, some have up to six. It all depends on on how we uh, classify these again. And sometimes we see alternate names for these, and I will give you both names. Um, and another thing to understand about the skin is that here's your dermis, okay? And this right here, that little layer, okay, is a lowermost layer and, and, and basically the youngest layer, okay, of the epidermis so this is so the epidermis is basically in real life is a thin layer of cells that they really look cuboidal even though they are squamous but they're cuboidal because these are cells actually that are dividing so the real epidermis in itself is a single layer of skin down here okay that's going to be producing the upper layers so, uh, but generally the way we look at skin is we always start on the top and work our way down. I'm going to start from the bottom and work our way up to the way the skin develops. So to begin with, um, we're going to look at first the stratum basale or what's called the stratum germinativum. There's two common names that's used. Stratum just means layer, basale means the base, or germinativum means this is a layer of this, the epidermis that produces the whole rest of the epidermis. So to understand the stratum basale, it is a layer of cells that for the most part, many of them are undergoing regular mitosis or asexual reproduction. So it's a single layer of mitotic cells. These are actually stem cells. That means they don't have a real job. Their main job is just to replicate. And there's two ways to replicate. One way is they can replicate by basically producing two equal cells of which one ends up on the top of the other. So you have the parent cell splits into two daughter cells, cell number one and cell number two. And this type of um, basically vertical placement of the cells or vertical replication is what makes the skin multi-layered. It produces that stratified layer. So what happens here 
is that when these when the stratum basale replicates, what's left behind is basically a replicative cell that will continue replicating and then a daughter cell on top of it. So as this replicates again, what happens is the new daughter cell pushes this one up to the upper layers. And this cell that was produced during that first replication moves up, moves up to become a different layer and eventually sheds off as a dead, dried up, shriveled cell. So that's one type of replication. And that's the most common type of replication that occurs just naturally. It usually in cycles and generally con uh, continuously. The other form of replication is more of a horizontal. And what happens is its cell produces a new cell next to it. And this is primarily done under certain circumstances. When the skin is being stretched, if the skin tears, like what you see in, a, in um, stretch marks or in an injury, the cells can replace that fill in that gap. So stretch marks are actually the skin growing more than the, uh, the point where the skin can stretch and it it tears apart that stratum basale layer and the discoloration you see you're actually looking at now a gap that is exposing some of the dermis and it takes on a different appearance than the regular intact skin so this type of um horizontal replication also allows the skin to grow with you as you're growing and even during pregnancy it allows the stomach to stretch and uh, and if you keep pulling on your skin it can allow it to stretch too so but what's neat about this is this is like, oh, it's not a permanent stretching, except when you're growing, of course. But when you get pregnant, or if you gain a lot of weight, and then you lose that weight or the pregnancy is now done, that's uh, uh, eventually that skin does regress and come back. Not always, though. And sometimes it has to be surgically removed, and the physician basically has to slice through that layer, you know, cut a big chunk out, and then glue the stratum basale layers together to allow them to attach and continue a regular growth cycle. So again, the stratum basale, what it does is it produces a stack of cells on top of it, and that becomes the next layer above. Now also in the stratum basale, you find the melanocytes. And what the melanocytes do is they deposit the brown colored pigment, okay, into the cells that are moving up. So, and this is kind of funny. So when I get a tan, what happens is my stratum basale cells, the new cells have, have pigment put into them after my exposure to the sun. And then those cells move up, move up, move up. And that's what makes my skin darker. But I notice if I'm not in the sun anymore, once these upper layers we're gonna see kind of disappear, okay, then the, the, the tan disappears with it. And this is why you lose your tan unless you're in continuous sun. Now, also under the, in that layer, we're going to find the dendritic cells. It means those macrophages that are waiting there, literally as little guardians, waiting for something to penetrate that barrier, and they're going to try to find it and detect it. Or if something cuts through the skin and hits down here, they're there to protect anything from getting deeper than the dermis. So that's the stratum basale layer. The stratum spinosum is the first stages of actually producing the functional skin. What, uh, uh, what happens with these cells is this is several layers of cells called keratinocytes, and these are dying cells. And you can see how these cells look different than any other epithelium, is that they're not tightly connected. The tight junction's gone, and what you see are the desmosomes barely holding them together. And we're going to talk a little more about this. So these cells are starting to dry up. But notice the gaps in those cells. Those gaps are very important because liquids from here can still ooze out and get in between those cells. And this is where also you find immune response taking place, particularly if you get rashes or irritation. That's where it takes place. Okay, so this layer has immune system chemicals in it that if the top of the skin is breached, they're still there. And if you ever get a blister, that's where blisters form, right in that layer. So that's the stratum spinosum. The stratum granulosum right here, granulosum means little spots. And these are now, the cell is dying, 
what you're seeing is basically the organelles just disappearing and the cells are filling with a protein called keratin it's laying itself down into sheets that's what the term laminate means and it is now being prepared to become the final layer of cells as they're pushed up the stratum corneum the stratum corneum is technically dead and it can vary from 20 to 30 or more layers. The stratum corneum on the bottoms of your feet, if, particularly if you walk barefoot, is probably about 40 layers. If you have calluses, thick areas of skin, um, this is all thickened stratum corneum. What's really interesting is when you put a lot of pressure and rubbing on the skin, it forces the stratum basale to produce a thicker stratum corneum. Now, stratum corneum is usually thin where you have folding areas what we you know and crevices in the skin so particularly around your armpits you don't want a thick stratum corneum on your fingertips you do to act as a barrier as a cushion and also to give ability to a brain without tearing the skin so these layers are all developmental layers they're not actually really real layers what it is is a maturation of the stratum basale cells as they get pushed up and up and up until the layer is gone and new ones below it replace it. So let's look at a little detail of the stratum basale or stratum germinativum. So again, it's the deepest layer of skin. It's, it's firmly attached to the connective tissue that makes up the dermis. So you're looking at very tight attachments. Okay, that basal layer is deep in place. Okay, um, it's a single roll of stem cells. Okay, it says there, it's also called stratum germinativum, if you didn't believe me. And it typically undergoes rapid division. Uh, they, they can mitose much quicker than the typical 24 hours we find in skin cell, I mean, in, in regular body cells. And what's neat about this too, is if you rub them and irritate them, they tend to replicate more. The problem with this rapid division is that whenever you have rapid mitosis, you place the cells in a lot of S phase. Okay, and during S phase, we find out this is when you get what's called telomere damage that ages the cells. It also uh, allows the cells to accumulate uh, DNA damage. That means sunlight and chemicals and exposure to this layer and even blood exposure to chemicals in that area can cause DNA damage in the form of mutations or in the form of cancer. So any cell that is rapidly replicating becomes damaged based on natural aging. That's why the skin ages faster than some of the rest of the body. And also it makes it susceptible to DNA damage and mutations. Uh, rapidly dividing cells are also most likely to get tumors. And one example is things like skin tags and other types of growths. Um, viruses can get into that layer and, and cause rapid replication, which then um, produces warts. And also diseases like psoriasis can make that uh, cell layer grow so quickly it produces a very thick crusty stratum uh, uh, um, corneum all over the surface of the cell and we'll talk about that a little later okay so again this is a very rapidly dividing body part and it also requires a lot of metabolism because remember in g1 of mitosis a lot of nutrients go here and a lot of oxygen so what we discover in children uh their skin development is a little slower mostly because of the the the, the nature of their body blood is going and energy is going into other purposes than to just feed mitosis. As people get older, particularly if they become diabetic or not eating as much, they don't have enough proteins and glucose. And in some cases, if they have respiratory disorders, enough oxygen to allow rapid division. So what happens is the stratum basale layer reproduces very slowly and that inhibits healing. It also inhibits skin thickness. So what happens is you end up with very thin upper layers in which the skin can spontaneously rip or tear and ulcerate. Now the time it takes a produced stratum basale cell, that means the replicate cell, to move up and be pushed up by replacement cells. Okay, that's the replacement, that's the guy moving up. It can take anywhere from 25 to 45 days depending on the location of skin, the age of the person, uh, diet, and, and health factors. So now, that upper layer of stratum basale that was produced, 
now turns into the stratum spinosum, which means the prickly layer. Stratum is prickly uh, layer, and spinosum means to form spines. So the cells are now starting to dry up. The cytoplasm is drying up. This protein called keratin is filling in. These fats are filling in, and, and basically the cells are only attached by the desmosomes, which leaves gaps between the skin. So this is the skin that sometimes, you know, uh, uh, again fills in with body fluids. It fills in with interstitial fluids and also leakage from the blood. And this provides kind of like an immune barrier, particularly during skin injury. It helps to set off the inflammatory response. So, um, so the skin cells are starting to die. Okay, they're, they're entering this pre-phase and it, they're abundant usually in melanin. And what you also find here are a lot of macrophages there to be in that area if that area det uh, detects any foreign agents or damage. Now, that stratum spinosum then matures into the stratum granulosum. And again, remember the stratum granulosum cells have little spots in them, little, little, lots of spots, little spots. And those spots now are basically the keratin drying up and basically forming sheets. Lamina means sheets. So here's, now you have a more squamous cell. This is where you really start seeing the squamous cell now in action. And what happens is these keratin proteins are now lining up like this and forming sheets, just like that, okay, next to each other, okay, inside the cell. And other proteins and other stuff are filling in there, granulating, and this now forms a protective barrier. This cell now, eventually, as it matures, squishes in, the cell is now dying, and it forms a physical barrier. It's a dead barrier that is waterproof, uh, uh, scratch proof, I mean, you name it. It's also partially oil proof. So it can repel a lot of things and it's almost acting like now, like a brick wall. Then in some skin, you have an area called the stratum lucidum. And this is a layer again between the uh, uh, stratum uh, um, granulosum and the stratum corneum. And don't confuse this sometimes on a slide with a tear in the slide. So sometimes what happens is the nature of the stratum granulosum, it doesn't ad adhere tightly to the stratum corneum on top. And it's very easy when you're making a slide and slicing skin to tear that layer. And it forms a gap that looks clear. This gap is not a gap. It's actually a group of cells in which the, 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 the lipids in it kind of act a little funny and it gives a shiny glow, like a glassy glow to it, particularly when it's stained. This is found usually in thick skin. So that means if you're sectioning off a part of the bottom of your foot or a callus, you will see it. But it's sometimes called a reaction skin. The stratum lucidum probably adds a little more waterproofing and also a little more cushioning. We don't really know what it is and some people think it's an artifact, it's a fake. But it's again, a row of flat cells, a little less uh, um, it's, it's a little more rigorous, okay, than uh, basically the stratum corneum. So we think it's a protective layer. And then last but not least, the stratum corneum, which actually means the horn layer, okay. And it could be anywhere to 20 to 30 rows of dead cells. It makes up, up to, in a normal skin, three quarters of the epidermal thickness. It's a very thick layer. And this is what's the predominant layer you'll see in the skin. You'll see mostly epidermis. And this is where the cells are really squamous now. The main function of the stratum corneum is it's meant to rub off. It's meant to flake off. So what happens that outer layer of skin flakes off and you will see this you know, in, in, in diagrams. So by having the outer level of skin flake off, it removes any dirt, any contaminants, anything on the skin surface. And also, if you, let's say, strip totally naked and then slide down on your floor and scrape across the floor, I wouldn't do that with my butt, though. You're better off doing it with your feet because it's a thicker skin. That allows you to do that type of abrasion without getting too crazy. So I wouldn't do it on rough cement. I would probably do that on a nice slippery waxy floor, but you're still losing that outer layer of stratum corneum, which is meant to be lost or abraded. Um, an example of the abraded cells, because there's constantly falling off, the cells undergo what's called desquamation. You see this in dandruff and hairy parts of your body, but normally you don't see this, but even just gently rubbing your skin 
will flake some of these cells off. So the whole idea is that outer layer is constantly being lost, constantly being lost. The stratum corneum is also highly waterproof because these cells are literally like a like a brick, like a plastic barrier that protects from a lot of things. That outer layer by abrading too also allows harmful chemicals to damage it and then the abraded skin falls off taking the harmful chemicals with it. Now guys, what's really horrible in some diseases like psoriasis or in other diseases that that, that are what we call idiopathic, we don't know the cause of it, causes the stratum basale to produce these incredibly thick, crusty stratum corneums that become so thick it's almost like scales on a fish or a reptile. And guys, understand, epithe, epi, the, the skin itself is found lining your mouth right to the gums, lining uh, the, uh, up the lower part of your urethra and also lining your vaginal tract. Think about that and the lining of your, the air canal. So imagine skin that is thick and crusty, almost like pure callus that can be up to a half inch thick of plates all over your skin. Imagine moving even your armpits. So the people that have these conditions, it's horrible. And in my, my many cases, they commit suicide because of the pain of these plates tearing the skin, constantly irritating the skin, and, 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 and you know just getting caught on clothing and whatever. Horrible, horrible condition. So that ends the epidermis on a nice note, and that leads us to the next layer called a dermis. So we're out of epithelium now, and we're in connective tissue, particularly areola connective tissue, which is a loose type of connective tissue. And we know what to expect out of connective tissue. Very few cells, a lot of matrix, and a lot of other junk that's in there. So the dermis is a strong, flexible layer. It literally helps to hold the epidermis in place to the underlying tissues. So this is like a strong, flexible glue that allows some stretch, but not enough to tear the epidermis off the underlying tissue. Okay, so it includes, of course, fibroblasts, which are constantly renewing this tissue. This tissue is constantly being rebuilt, replaced all the time. It's what we call a reactive tissue. It's constantly responding to stress and strain and other stuff. It also contains uh, fibrocytes. That means mature cells that hang out in there. Okay, not doing anything in particular except just hanging out. Then there's macrophages. We've talked about white blood cells that are the sentinels of the immune system. And occasionally we'll find other white blood cells like lymphocytes and what are called mast cells. Mast cells are involved in allergies. And, white, and other white blood cells called lymphocytes that are involved in producing antibodies against foreign agents. And also these cells called killer cells, which, which can attack large organisms. The dermis we're going to see is divided into what's called a papillary nail, uh, layer, which means bumps, or I hate to say this, breasts, or the reticular layer, which means a very fibrous layer that we're going to see is the main layer that attaches the dermis to the underlying tissue. So now let's take a look at the dermis. So you can see what the dermis is. The dermis runs from here. We can see a fair amount of structure in it to right about here to the level of the hypodermis. So we can see the papillary layer here and right about here. And this is kind of arbitrary in a way is a reticular layer, but when you look under the microscope, it's a little more evident because you'll see um, swirls of uh, con uh, connective tissue in there, particularly of collagen. So the upper part of the dermis or the pepper layer is a very important layer. It is, of course, um, an areolar connective tissue, okay, that contains these strong fibers called collagen. They have elastic fibers which are flexible and understand what the collagen does it's like cables and if we think back to the guy holding his skin in the opening slide the remember, look at the skin how it just shaped around its body like a capsule and this is what the collagen does it forms that outer coating of us and holds it in shape and gives very little resistance it just holds this tight shape that keeps the skin nice and snug and it resists stretching the elastic fibers do allow the skin to stretch somewhat but to a limit but it also allows snap back in children, what happens is their skin is very high in elastic uh, fibers, very high, uh, low in collagen, and it makes the skin very stretchy, almost sometimes at a point where you can tear the skin. But this, and, and in some people, they have actually a genetic condition with low collagen, high elastin, and they can stretch the skin out for a very long distance, even in some cases pulling a, lip over, a, a lower lip over their nose. 
um, as we get older, the collagen basically tends to stay high and the elastin starts to get lower. And this makes the skin feel a little more leathery. It looks a little more stiff. It actually makes the skin start to wrinkle a little because you lose that elasticity. And the skin kind of pulls on itself and tugs and wrinkles. And also what happens if you try to pull your skin, it can stretch, but it may not snap back. And also elastin is what allows gravity to uh, you to resist gravity. That means you're hanging parts or resist your pendulous parts are support, supported and kept up by elastin so as we get older the skin wrinkles and all those parts that hung nice and out when we were younger are now sagging down to the floor and that sounds so wonderful okay so um so that's the role of these fibers again and i can't stress that more because environmental exposure could really wreak havoc on the ratio of these um uh, uh fibers uh, we also see blood vessels, particularly capillaries, in this papillary layer. So when we dig deeper now into this papillary layer, the blood vessels that are in there are primarily going to be capillaries. It means very small blood vessels. And these capillaries are what allow your body to retain heat or give off heat and work together with sweating. So if blood from the lower part of the dermis which is where the, that large amount of blood is stored in these larger blood vessels blood from those blood vessels if they pump up into those capillaries and swell them that releases heat to the environment so the body cools so if you're in a warm and uh, environment you release that inner body temperature out to there and it loses body heat now if you're in the cold, what happens is you're, you know, you detect this, and what happens is your body tries to retain heat by not putting blood into there. So it cuts the blood supply off that retains the heat inside the body. Because, guys, you're not trying to keep your skin warm, you're trying to keep the internal part of your body from not losing heat. So you use the capillary blood flow to do that. Now, the problem is, is like if you're cutting blood supply to the skin, that can cause the skin to have less oxygen. And could actually be subject to frostbite under extremely cold or windy situations and that's why frostbite occurs is because this the skin has not enough blood flow and you can actually get the skin down to the outside temperature and these capillary loops are affected by things like alcohol so alcohol for example expands these loops it encourages the body to pump blood into them which is why some people get what's called alcohol flush they tend to put more you know uh, uh blood into there particularly in the face and they and they look red okay uh, uh and this is dangerous particularly in colder climates when i was living in uh, doing work in fairbanks uh particularly on the nice cold minus 40 days um i would hear stories of people at a bar they they're drunk they get in a fight they kicked out of the bar they may be wearing a light jacket or a sweater and they sit down and they just freeze to death on the street and, and, and that was not an unusual situation in some areas um, smoking could tend to play havoc on those capillaries too and and maybe constrict those calories capillaries which also affects the ability of a skin to, to cool and maintain body temperature misers corpuscles they're for light touch they allow to have delicate touch and this is the hardest thing about making robotic parts particularly robotic fingers and machines that can feel is they don't we can't make things as sensitive as a meisner corpuscle and that can communicate with a with a computer the way our meisner's corpuscles communicate with the brain so these are for light touch so this is where you start feeling tickling because these get annoyed when you get tickled okay but you can feel rubbing tickling you can feel uh, um, all sorts of sensitivities and allows you to adjust your touch to the situation and then there's free nerve endings these free nerve endings uh feel pain and they they, they detect chemicals associated with damage like what are called histamines they also can feel pressures they could also feel excessive vibrations and there's also thermal receptors present in this area too that actually detect vibration actually changes in vibration that your body detect or determine as change in temperature, meaning going from hot to cold. And then now be careful about the papillary layer, because the papillary layer is ridges, but those are microscopic ridges that you can't see. 
Now, there's these things called fingerprints, and we also have prints on the bottom of our feet, but we don't talk about footprints so much or toe prints because fingerprints are very unique to the individual, and the genes that program them are kind of arbitrary, as a matter of fact. They don't produce the same fingerprints, I believe, in identical twins. So what we have here is that is not due to the papillary layer in a way. It's due to ridges within the papillary layer, not the bumpiness themselves. So what this diagram shows is that you have the papillary ridges on large ridges in themselves. And these large ridges are your fingerprints. And they're usually associated with, and it shows pores. There's no such thing as really skin pores. Those are sweat gland openings. So you have these sweat glands that come out through there, uh, that pop up through there to the epi, through the epidermis of the skin. And these we believe are allowed for gripping. It's by accident that they're so variable. So these allow grip. It allows us to get a better grip and almost produces like a little vacuum. Geckos really take advantage of this by having very extensive epidermal ridges that they can literally climb on glass and climb on brick with them. So the fingerprints themselves are not due to the papillary uh, 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 bumps, but it's due to ridges itself in underlying layers that give that ridges to ridges. And you can see what's called a primary ridge, secondary ridge, don't worry about that. Now the reticular layer is thicker than the papillary layer, and most of it is for support and resiliency. It also predominantly attaches your skin to that hypodermis through lots of what are called hydrogen bonds. It's enough hydrogen bonds to hold it, hold it in place, but not enough that if the skin is steamed or burned, it will peel off. And I've seen horrible situations where people had steam burns, and if you pull on their skin too much, it tears the whole skin off like a glove. Kind of gross, but it does exist, it does happen. Now with skin color, okay, this is really a property of the epidermis. But with skin color, skin color is due to a brown chemical called melanin. It's a protein. We call it a pigment. And what that pigment does, it's a light shield. And it, and it, and it basically protects the lower layers of skin. Because remember, all cells are invisible. They're clear. Sunlight will pass right through them. And you see this in people called albinos or albinos, where they're lacking melanin. Okay, and the sunlight just damages and heats that skin. So melanin has a protective value to keep the skin cooler. And it sounds kind of silly because you say, oh, black skin, black absorbs heat. Black also loses heat, but the melanin is not really black. It's a brown pigmentation. It looks black when it's thick enough. But what it does is it, 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 it absorbs that sunlight and keeps it from heating and underneath skin. Also, okay, it protects somewhat from ultraviolet light, UV light. That's a horrible U, but UV light. Not totally, but somewhat. And some people freckle, they get moles. All of this is due to uh, uh, variations in how we produce melanin or sometimes signs of um, cancers of these cells that, that, are, that are very aggressive cancers. Some skin color is also due to a pigment called carotene, which is literally found in carrots. It gives carrots that orangish yellow color. And if you eat enough car uh, carotene, carotene is what we call lipid soluble. It will actually soak into the fat inside the skin because the skin tries to excrete the stuff and sometimes it just gets st stored so uh i remember as a kid particularly my mom's uh, hungarian side they used to believe in drinking carrot juice as a way of being healthy and if you drink too much your skin literally turns like a carrot and if you dye your hair green you could be the walking carrot person but this could also be dangerous to the liver because the liver also detoxifies ca uh, carotin and it can literally kill you people have died from this from overdosing on carotene and carotene uh, relatives of the carotene are using birth control pill they're using skin defoliants and other things like that too and it's not unusual for people who are taking vitamins the pill and also sometimes taking tanning pills or stuff for acne end up overdosing on it to the point of being harmful. Uh, so carotene's uh, uh, purpose, it's probably just a byproduct. Now hemoglobin is found in the blood vessels of the skin. You have these large blood vessels in that lower part of the dermis. 
uh, that and the skin is somewhat transparent you know above those blood vessels so you can see the redness in there and it's, and again this is what causes blushing and and gives the skin sometimes a, a, a little red hue and when you're warm the skin gets more red because now the capillaries are loaded with blood and gives more of a red effect and skin color could also be due to diet and other things depending on what you eat like beets now another thing are what are called skin markings or what are called cleavage lines and this sounds kind of weird but this is also associated with wrinkling and sagging and other wonderful stuff associated with aging woo wee i love it okay so the way your collagen fibers are laid out is they're laid out in bundles and this is something called segmentation segmentation or somite formation somite not termite but somite it means our body is laid down in a plan that is linear and this is separate and this is where because your appendages are kind of like the opposite your append what you have to think of is a four-legged stance so in a four-legged stance this will work where this is actually kind of sideways when your arms are down in a four-legged stance so what happens is you get these little areas or ridges in which each ridge represents a separate aspect of the body that we call a segment and they and the um fibers in the skin are laid down that way in this way this is almost invisible you see this literally once you take the skin off particularly if you're doing things not like human skin but tanning in animals and stuff like this and, and when you're cutting through the skin and sectioning it so it's really kind of cool but what physicians have learned if you cut along these lines the skin will heal better because you're not cutting across fibers that then don't heal right because when collagen fibers are cut they form a different type of tissue a scar tissue and particularly people that keloid that develop these disgusting scars that, that keep growing that could be a problem and with cosmetic surgery they try to be careful too to cut along these lines because literally you can cut a chunk of this out and sew it together and it heals nicely but if you cut it this way you can end up with scarring and with irregularities so this is kind of neat when we look at this it's just the way we are based on our our ancestry from other animals so now we're out of the skin organ we've now moved into the world of the appendages or accessory organs of the skin that means these act individually from the rest of the system some of them are derived from the epidermis from dermis and from other you know body areas from other organ systems so the appendages of the skin include sweat glands which uh, these are produce liquidy secretions oil glands which produce uh, waxy secretions which are either dead cells or whole actual cells that sacrifice their life to become a stinky oily secretion appendages of the skins include hair okay within the hair follicle itself it includes nails and if you're a beast it includes things like horns not antlers if you have antlers antlers on deer are actually bone that the skin flakes off and sheds off but horn like on a rhinoceros or whatever is very equivalent to nail uh, and uh, equivalent to the nails so to get into sweat glands sweat glands there's several different types they're also called sudoriferous glands sudor means liquid ferrous means to pass out you know whatever i don't mean like pass out like the way you feel like in a lecture or after a test we mean to pass through so sudoriferous glands pass sweat and the ma and uh, and the major type of sweat gland is called the eccrine or meroquine gland and i love these terms but eccrine basically means uh it's a gland that produces stuff that flows out ecra ec meaning out and crying meaning gland so meroquine gland also happens to do with marrow comes from the term like ocean so it's a fluid salty secretion isn't that poetic so these type of sweat glands are very abundant in your palms and your soles and your forehead they're also found throughout the skin but most abundant this is why some of you you know sweat from your palms sweat from your feet why they sweat on the palm and the feet because it does make it kind of slippery but not really so with your dermal ridges so this involves a better grip it acts like a glue water is sticky remember it has these what's called these colligative adhesive properties that make it sticky like a glue so it gives you an added grip in very dry climates it's hard to grip very cold climates when the moisture is not on your skin now sometimes the skin can get too wet where it becomes slippery and that's a problem in itself 
on the forehead, why that sweats is it's uh, why it is more up there is because the head really tends to get a lot of heat and retain heat and also take in a lot of heat from the environment. So it keeps the head much cooler because your head loses a lot of body heat. In cold climates, that's why you keep a lot of long fuzzy hair or you wear a hat. I mean, because that's you lose a lot of your body heat through there. And that's why the forehead tends to sweat a lot because the most it's the big exposed area that doesn't have hair because hair does hinder heat loss and um, it's very difficult to sweat through hair because it just kind of gets a mucky and, and prevents heat loss. So a sweat itself is mostly water. It's, it's salt, sodium chloride. It does contain water-soluble vitamins because vitamins, guys, vitamins that dissolve in water. That means vitamin C, vitamin B in particular, they will be lost through sweat. And that's why people, that particularly people that sweat a lot and high-performance athletes, they take vitamin C and B a fair amount. Okay, and it's also present in things like Gatorade. The sweat contains antibodies because those antibodies help to fight infection, particularly when you're exposed to disease. It protects any other contact from that disease because the antibodies stick to those things and keep them from getting through that epidermis and through into the dermis. Um, uh, they produce... Um, uh, germinocidin, which is a chemical that's actually antibiotic. So, uh, uh, and uh, other animals produce this in their mouth. We don't for some reason. Dogs and cats in particular produce a lot of this in the mouth because the mouth is also epidermis and contains uh, dermocidin glands, which are, which are similar to sweat glands. Our mouths don't do that. That's why you don't lick a dog on the mouth. You don't kiss your cat because their mouths are more germicidal and anything that comes into their mouth will become more infectious than yours. It's okay for them to lick your skin because you produce this chemical in your skin. And so a lot of metabolic waste like urea and again, what we call xenobiotics, X-E-N-O, biotic get rid of the sweat. So sweat is important besides cooling. So sweat is connected to pores. We call sweat gland pores. And guys, you hear people talk about pores of the skin being this and that with health. A lot of that's garbage. You don't open and close these pores. Heating, of course, makes you sweat and these pores release. Some people believe that by sweating a lot, you're removing body toxins. That's not necessarily true because, I mean, toxins are mostly removed by your liver and your urea through your urea. Okay, but, but manipulating pores doesn't really do too much to you. As a matter of fact, the, the, the Romans and the ancient Greeks used to believe that you don't bathe because it ruins the nature of the skin. It, it drowns the pores and clogs the pores. So what they used to do is actually do what's called abrasion. And that's where loofah sponges come in, is they used to take um, actual real ocean sponges. Loofah is actually from a cucumber type plant, a gourd. But they take pumice rock. That means literally soft rock from volcanoes because Italy and Greece were loaded with them and even buried the people sometimes. But they take pumice rock or they take um, sponges because sponges grow a lot in the Mediterranean region and they'd scrape their skin. And sometimes they'd even use metal scrapers to basically scrape open those pores and let out the toxins and also scrape out that outer layer of skin. Sweat is primarily important in thermal regulation. And remember, there's two types of sweat. There's the watery sweat which is mostly for thermal regulation, so you lose water but not salt. And then there's the, the, ex, the excretion sweat, which contains a lot of your salts. Under dry conditions and ice cold conditions, you are losing watery sweat. Under overactivity conditions, exercise, you are losing salty sweat. So that's where the water Gatorade issue comes in. It's how these eccrine glands or mericline glands work. Then there's what are called apocrine sweat glands. And the name here, uh, apo, is, is a little, it's kind of a little confusing to see why they're called that. And this is probably more due to their shape and location. So they are confined, remember this from chapter one, to axillary, and I love this, to anogenital areas. That means around your rear end and around your genitals. Okay, yes, we said that word. Okay. These produce a type of material called sebum. It's sweat mixed with fatty, gooey substances and proteins. I hate to tell you this, but this is related to what breasts release too. Isn't that nice to know? 
So the sweat of your crotch and your armpits is related to the sweat, the milk that comes out of your breasts. So does it mean it's all edible? Uh, yeah, except breasts don't release certain things that the apical glands release, like sex hormones and scents. So what is the function of these? Mostly to produce odor. Isn't that wonderful? So in men, your apical sweat glands are mostly active in your armpits. This is a genetic thing. And our armpits release these fatty substances and proteins that women are supposed to like the smell of or anyone that's attracted to men, period, are supposed to like that smell. These smells are called musks. You know what? Male deer produce this in their nose. Dogs produce this in their butt. That's why dogs smell each other's butt. They go, hey, Joe, I recognize you and you are a Joe. I don't even have to look. And that's why dogs, will, uh, particularly female dogs, will smell a male's armpit. In general, dogs will smell a male's armpit because that's how they know you. Hey, stinky pits. And women, your apical glands are mostly concentrated around the vagina and towards the rear end. So that's why dogs love coming up to you and sticking their nose right there. And you, when I would bring people home and my dogs would come up as the first way they greet females it was really really a good night killer okay when my dogs would do that without even asking okay so that's why i used to lock them in a room when people came over but um because dogs are much more sensitive to that and women what's unfortunate is that the chemicals we give off which i mean women give off which are called fragrances not musk musk is more related to skunk odor which is tell something about men's armpits um, and also the, some of the crotch area they release too but women we've learned that moose and and deer and elk are also attracted to your anal genital uh, glands too and i've heard cases when i was in canada and alaska of women literally almost getting killed by male moose that were attracted to them and guys a moose can get the size of a, a, a school bus you don't want one of them getting a little friendly with you so wow this lecture has gone bad so what happens is a lot of these ducks go to hair follicles why because the hair holds on to that stink and it makes it persistent it's almost like putting a smell in a sponge and using that to hold on and distribute the smell and that might be a reason that we have pubic hair and armpit hair now what's really funny some races of people my mom's in general they ha we have no armpit here very little hair on our bodies at all so does that make us less attractive i don't know at least smell wise i don't know it's really kind of interesting and again we do have modified apical and sweat glands we have what are called ceruminous glands which is what makes air wax isn't that nice air wax is protected it also helps to conduct sound through the air. It does protect it from infections. And some people hypersecrete airwax at a point where it looks like there's like this gooey crust coming out of their ears and they have to have it literally medically removed. Uh, children tend to produce it a little more as you get older. And we do know that there's people that have a gene for what's called dry air and wet air. And it has to do with the nature of the wax. Is the wax dry or wet? And what that has as far as effect on air infections, I don't know, but it is typical of, of certain races of people and typically uh, uh, Caucasians and, and Blacks have uh, different earwax constituencies and than asiatic people okay and then we have the mammary glands the breasts again they are modified sweat glands that we tend to pay too much attention to sometimes in our society so when we look at these sweat glands now there's your eccrine glands look at that and what you're looking at here is under the microscope so you're looking at the tubes from the side that means just like that transverse cut and this is a section here that is like that. You're looking at that loop right there. So these are kind of loops. Notice that they're in the middle part of the dermis. Okay. So, um, and again, cuboidal cells, real nice. There's your duct. And that's all collagen fiber. And some of these cells are fibrocytes. There we go. That's all fibrocytes. Because remember, connect, uh, connective tissue is found beneath the epithelium, holding it in place. Uh, um, so those are your eccline glands. And again, they produce sweat now with the sebaceous or oil glands again they're widely distributed mostly developing hair follicles and we know that they're active during puberty that's when people start to stink of their puberty olders men in their armpits feminine the females in the crotch and both males and females sometimes in the anal area and it's and and this oil secretion is what we call holocrine that means that it's 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 unlike sweat that it's not really oily i mean it's not really watery 
but it's more of a water mixed with fats and, and other materials and even chunks of cell. It could have bacteria bactericidal uh, property, and it could have a, a, a property of also softening the skin and hair. And this is something about people, too. If you come from a very oily race of people versus a very dry skin race of people, is that um, this tends to sometimes reduce aging of the skin by keeping the skin moist. And also it acts as a, a, an extra water barrier. Because guys, when you go swimming, water does absorb into the epidermis, it, particularly in that the, the, the uh, stratum corneum, and it swells the skin and makes it wrinkly and yucky until the skin dries. Sebaceous glands prevent that from happening. And, and, and so people, particularly with greasy skins, they don't get that squint skin wrinkling and, and, and uh, uh, softening like you do in people that have drier skin. And whether skin is dry or oily, I don't know how that affects your survivability. So where do you see the sebaceous glands? There they are. Sometimes they're near a hair follicle, which for the most part, sometimes they're not. And look at that. That's the gland. Now, the thing is, this is a big chunk of gland with a very tiny duct. It's hard to see the duct. The duct is usually going to crawl right up into what's called the hair follicle. Uh, they're, they're not twisted and turned like the eccrine glands. This is a very thicker secretion, a more oily secretion. So let us look at a word I have trouble pronouncing here. Okay, hair is literally a separate organ of the skin. And to think of how hair is produced, when you look at skin, make believe this is now your whole epidermis. And then underneath there is your dermis. When you're a fetus, this is what your skin looks like. You have no accessory structures. The skin itself is the only organ that's really there. Other stuff hasn't migrated in yet. When you become an adult, what happens, is, I shouldn't say even an adult, when the fetus grows up, what happens is that epidermis takes a little dent in. And it takes a little dent in. And that then what it does is it pushes its way into the dermis and forms these little bubbles that eventually what happens next is really kind of an interesting thing. Then what happens is that this forms a little bubble now up. And that little bubble now up takes on its own genetic awareness. And what that little bubble does is it now produces a modified stratum corneum that gets extruded as hair. And some people, that process doesn't happen, just like is true in many of our animal ancestors and relatives, like frogs, for example. In birds, that takes on a very special, weird type of uh, uh, um, condition where it makes this hair that is multi-branch, and you call them feathers. Okay, in fish, that produces a flat scale. Instead of having a little bubble, it's a flat indentation that, grow, that, that grows down into the skin and produces a hair-like material that we call scales in fish. So this is kind of neat when we look at hair. Now, so hair, what is its purpose? In ancient times, it told us that something was on your body. Something was crawling around. I hate to tell you that. It's an alert system. Hair also is a cushion. It, it prevents heat loss. It holds on to sweat sometimes to regulate body temperature loss. It blocks sunlight. If you are losing hair on your head, you find that out real quickly as your head sunburns where it's before it doesn't. But it acts like an air cushion too. You know, it's like wearing clothing, particularly if you have a very damn hairy body, sort of like uh, an ape or a Neanderthal, whatever. Um, so it does have a lot of purpose to it. And the color of the hair makes a very big difference. Uh, darker hair tends to protect from heat more than lighter hair. And it also tends to block ultraviolet light compared to lighter hair. Um, hair is found all over the body surface, except the soles of your feet, your palms of your hands. You don't want hair on there uh, because it kind of reduces grip. And some people can have hirsutism in those body parts. It's not very good. You don't have hair on the lips. I mean, some people do a little, and that, but, you know, that's kind of not good because it traps food. On the nipples, we don't have hair. Again, some people do, but that's just, you know, variations of genes. And um, generally, portions of the external genitalia, because particularly a man, 
uh, we don't want hair on that thing because it does kind of get in the way and it makes it kind of dirty and nasty. So, um, so some surfaces are not protected, including hair on your eyelids and whatever. Hair is not a protein. It is dead cells. Think of it as a compressed stratum corneum. It is stratum corneum. When you take a bunch of hair and wrap and put the follicles really tight, you have a horn, like on a rhinoceros. So it is actually cells that are so dry and compressed, the cell membranes disappear, the cytoplasm fuses, and you have this hair shaft. Nails, we're going to see a little more fusion going on. But actually in here, you can remove the individual cells and still see them for the most part, particularly the edges of the hair. And you can collect the DNA from that hair. You know what's bad too? When hair is made, every chemical that was in your blood ends up in the hair. And hair can last for a long time on your body, meaning I can, because then the stratum uh, corneum doesn't do that. The stratum corneum is gone in like, you know, several days. Okay. Uh, I mean, actually, you know, within a month. But hair can persist for a long time, particularly if you have long hair. The tips of that hair can be very old because hair grows from the bottom out, up, and pushes those outer layers. So you could show up with um, chemical residues. Let's say you accidentally inhaled some marijuana or something because you thought you had a condition that, re, you know, relieved by marijuana. It can show up in your hair for months. Okay, isn't that nice to know? And that's why hair is used sometimes for testing of drugs. Skin, not as much. The skin is more for looking at co uh, current usage. Um, so hair, just like stratum corneum, contains a lot of keratin, and that's the major pi uh, um, background pigment of your hair. Hair also contains melanin. Again, the, the melanocytes are not in the hair. They're at the base of the hair. And this gives it a yellow to rusty brown to black. So that's what's funny, guys. I don't, there's no distinction between blonde, brown, red, and black. It all has to do with where the melanin is located and how much. If you have very little melanin located in the, in the center of the hair, you have blonde hair. If you have no melanin, you have white to silver hair, gray hair sometimes we call it. If you have moderate amount of melanin located toward, evenly distributed in the hair, you have brown hair. If it's a, lot, a fair amount of melanin located towards the center of the hair, you have red hair. If you have melanin that's a lot, throughout all of the hair, particularly the surface of the hair, then you have black hair. And it's, and it's black only because sunlight doesn't penetrate it because the brown is so dense. Now, what are the types of hair we find in our body? We find what is called baby hair. Baby hair is the hair you're born with on your body. It tends to be, it could be long. I mean, you can end up with monkey baby. Velous hair can be so long, but velous means like thin paper, paper thin. It, it's pale, usually has no pigmentation, it's very slender, very thin, actually finer than the hair that might be on your arms or wherever else you have hair. Again, it's usually in children. We sometimes find it in adult females. For some reason, ch females retain this juvenile hair, and I don't know why. Maybe it gives the skin an appearance of youth, I don't know, or an appearance of who knows what that makes men happy, okay, or whoever's attracted to females happy. Okay, With the, and usually the velum here, again, except in females, tends to fall out. We have terminal hair. That means this is hair that is usually thick. It could take on different shapes. That means you could have a straight shaft, which produces straight hair, a curled half, which produces curl, uh, curl, uh, uh, curly hair, and then a shaft that's at an, a tangent angle that produces kind of, a, a, um, you know, in between curly, tight curly, and um, straight hair, which we call wavy hair. And there's variations within that, okay? So we find terminal hair is usually the most, has the most melanization for the person. It's found in your armpits, and it's found on your scalp, and there's actually two genetic conditions of the scalp hair. Is usually the terminal hair grows and grows and grows and is thicker than the axillary hair. Imagine if your armpit hair grew to be about five feet long. Oh my gosh, you can braid it, beat it, do whatever you want with it. I think that would be kind of rather unusual. And the same would be true for your pubic hair. If your pubic hair grew three feet long, that could be incredible. You'd have to tuck it into your socks. So this hair has what's called limited growth. That means it reaches a certain length and it stops and it sheds regularly. Whereas scalp hair doesn't shed as much and it has sometimes 
unlimited growth. Now, to people, this looks kind of funny. The scalp here, you have some people I know that can have hair down to their legs in no time. The length of scalp here depends on the rate of growth and also the cycling time when hair is shed. I knew a guy who, for some reason, he shed his hair so fast on his head, his hair never got more than an inch and a half long. He never had to cut it, whereas mine will grow and grow and grow till I look like Monkey Boy, okay, or like I'm in a rock band. So the hair does have growth phases. We believe that there's a resting phase, a regressive phase, a shedding phase, which occurs in one to three month periods depending on the person. And again, so whatever. So the hair does go through cycles. And some cycles can last six to 10 years. This is incredible. And it's shorter for pubic hair and eyebrow hair, you know, for some of this finer terminal hair. Okay. And some people just can't grow hair. There's some type of defect. Or they have hair that sheds quickly. Some type of defect. Hair growth is also uh, uh, conditioned by hormones. In males, particularly with testosterone, this can inhibit eventually terminal hair growth on the head, and it's also true in females. So there's sometimes genetic patterns. And baldness, actually, we find out in many animals is a natural sign of um, maturity and health, believe it or not. And I tell that to my younger brother all the time who's bald. He keeps saying it makes me look old. I said, no, it makes you look virile and healthy and mature and smart which makes me look kind of dumb and, you know, weakling, okay, which we believe, funny enough, the opposite in our own society. So this is the, the major types of hairs that we find. When we look at a hair now from the side, this is a lateral view. That's where the, the this is actually stratum basale, stratum germinativum, that's modified into a separate organ that you call hair, that produces a stratum corneum, there's actually is, actually there actually is the same layers of skin here that you find, the same layers you find in skin. So this is actually what's called the medulla. This is just yuck. This is yuck. Then we find something equivalent to action, actually the stratum, the lower strata of the skin. So we find the equivalent of the strata Spinosum, the stratum granulosum, for the hair, this is a cross section. It means you're taking the hair in section like that and looking down on it, transverse. So, and this is the beat equivalent of the stratum corneum. So, hair is like a tight bundle of skin that is dying and dead. And these are the cells that usually take DNA samples from. Sometimes you'll find a blood vessel that runs into hair, and sometimes the hair is covered with an oil and with grease. And this is usually where the pigmentation is. The pigmentation is usually in there, and it's usually deposited, deposited either a lot towards the, whoops, let me make that a darker color. So it's deposited usually like here. It could be deposited just here, or it could be deposited uniformly, or it could be deposited a lot or a little. So this is a cross section of the hair. It's very much like skin, except it developed into a separate organ type structure. And again, this is showing the base of the skin. There's your melanocytes that put the secretion into hair. And what happens with the hair is just like with the skin, is this layer here, all this layer here, is being pushed up and out. And the medulla and the cortex don't worry about. But in elderly hair, elderly people's hair gets thinner. That's because what happens is the medulla disappears and the pigmentation disappears from here and the skin gets thinner and clearer and eventually gray or white. So we're covering, we're closing this down now, and we're finally looking at the structure of the nail. So think about hair now that is flattened into a plate, very much like a fish scale, and we're now drying that skin so much and aging it so much that the cell is totally gone. You don't even see the cells in it. So the cells are squeezed and extruded. And basically all it is now is solid cytoplasm. Squeeze and ooze out those plate-like sheets of keratin mixed with oil and pigments and other gunk, lipids. That's a waterproof layer. It's so waterproof the nails don't swell when wet. Here will. Nails won't. So when we look at the structure of a nail, and I'm not going to make you know the anatomy of the nail, the lunule. Now you know what that's called. And there's the 
the um, cuticle, which is like the the excretory. This is where the, the nail is part of the nail is secreted. And there's your free edge or hyponychium, which means below the nail itself, that little area there. So, so and that's the body of the nail. The nice thing about the nail is it is an indicator of health. It's an indicator of protein deficiency. And guys, just like here, you can take a chunk of nail out and do a drug test. You could also look for hormones and metabolites. That means if a people if a person was uh, having hormone shifts or, or toxins in the blood. You can even tell a person diet by metabolites that end up in a nail. Again, just like hair. So nails continuously grow at particular rates depending on genetics, whatever, and it's just like the hair follicle. So the nail is produced here and it's basically pushed out and squeezed out and guided along by the uh, cuticle, okay, which has a little oily edge on there and the nail just grows and grows. That means the, this is the oldest part, cells that have been pushed out by cells beneath it. So cells are constantly being produced and died and squished out. And man, I, and, and what happens here at this point, as the nail gets old, it dries and curls. Because what happens is the nail is actually wet when it first comes out. And as it dries, it curls to, to form this free edge. And that's why when people grow their nails really long, that curl gets exaggerated. And I've seen pictures where people have nails that are this long, and then there's their finger, and there's no good purpose for it to have a nail like that, my gosh, except it's an interesting decoration. Okay, so that's it. We're now going to look at where does skin come from. So guys, skin is the most complex structure, and it's so subject to many birth defects, it isn't funny. Because guys, when we start looking at organ systems, for example, like the nervous system, it is totally from the ectoderm. Muscle and bone are totally from the mesoderm. Same is true for the circulatory system. The digestive system, respiratory system are totally from endoderm. But the skin is amazing. It is literally composed of ectoderm and mesoderm that work together and fuse together. And some of you are doing papers on pa uh, babies with birth defects, uh, diseases like uh, Harlequin's disease, where sometimes the ectoderm and the mesoderm don't develop normally, and that causes horrible, hideous skin defects, okay, uh, and th that permanently impairs the function of the skin. So the epidermis itself, it's ectoderm. This is related to the same tissue that produces the nervous system except the skin stays on the outside, the, nerves, the nervous system punctuates into the inner part of the body, except for the melanocytes, the remnants of the nervous system. Mesoderm produces the dermis and hypodermis because mesoderm is very good at producing connective tissue. Epithelium usually comes from ectoderms. That means nerve tissue is actually re related to uh, uh, epithelium. And that's why if we ever look at nerve regeneration, we're looking at making the ectoderm behave the way it's supposed to, like a highly reproductive cell. Okay, um, in babies, you get a velum type here. It's a little more velum-y. It's called lanugo here. And this is actually really baby here. It, and I don't know what the function of it is, except we think it's a, it's a remnant of our ancestry. And, and, and these hairs appear a little later, but they are sometimes an indicator of health in a baby, whether the hair grows too much or not at all. Okay, so this is a little different than the vindivillum is an immature hair, but it's not the hair that's found on the fetus. This is a fetal hair, and it may be a practice hair, I don't know. And then uh, um, uh, during fetal development, we also find that the, the, in the fetus, sebaceous glands and other structures, okay, begin to develop very early and develop from basically this some mes uh, from this mesoderm tissue and from also ectoderm tissue because glands are actually ectodermal so again this is a law this is a cooperation of the body making this material so now let's look at skin from a point where you'll never see it under a microscope because this is done with a very different type of microscope they can see much more than what yours can and this is a smaller view this is a bigger view so you're looking at full thickness skin so i want to give you an idea of perspective now that's the outermost layer of your stratum corneum. It's shedding, and this tends to be a thicker skin. I can actually almost see what look like pockets of stratum lucidum. So this is your epidermis. 
That's that bead germ. Can everybody see the, der the dermal ridges and the really dark layer here? That's your epidermis. Notice that the, this, the lower layer of the epidermis doesn't stain as much as the upper layer. So it's just the proteins here absorb the stain. Here's your dermis, reticular layer, all the way to about here. And then now this is your hypodermis because it starts getting to the point where I don't see blood vessels here. You start seeing fat cells. So this is now what's actually called the fascia. So this stuff here is your upper fascia with your hypodermis. Okay, you see fat cells. You can see a lot of structures in here. This is your lower fascia. Okay, so this is almost primarily all fat cells. Isn't that wonderful with, with connective tissue that helps to hold it in place? And these act like little pillars or little cables. It's really kind of funny. So, and then here's now skeletal muscle. Oh, can everybody see it? That's muscle right there. And that's not cardiac. It looks like it, but it's just the nature of this cut. So this is actually skeletal muscle right here underneath the skin. And above that is a layer that, that, um, of connective tissue that directly adheres to the hypodermis. So what happens is that skin moves and back and forth. I'll kind of get rid of all the background junk. So as the skin moves back and forth, okay, and as muscle contracts, it tends to stretch the skin with it and prevents it from tearing away. So let's look at an actual drawing of this. So there's your epidermis, dermis, your superficial area or hypodermis, and this kind of goes down to the deep, to almost where you added a hypodermis. This is those proteins I talked about, those connectors that act kind of like little cables or pillars. So you'd have adipose tissue filling in here. And then these are the larger blood vessels down found in the um, hypodermis. I mean, if you get cut down there, you're in major trouble. That's where you get some big bleeders. So these are trunk lines. And then you get down to what's called the deep fascia, which is, which is connected to a layer called hyaluronic acid. This is a glue, a very protein glue. What's funny is hyaluronic acid is um, it's a sugary substance that sometimes people inject into their skin to add youthfulness to the skin. It's also found in the belly button. Isn't that nice to know? And, and people use this as kind of an oily kind of material. And you could also use it as a hand softener. It's found in lanolin, which comes from sheep rather than humans, which would be gross. And then what we find here with the muscle is something called the epimyceum. This is a connective tissue layer that adheres to that, uh, hy uh, that uh, hypodermis or fascial layer. So now, guys, we talked about injury and how injury occurs in tissues. But guys, with skin, skin is subject not just to trauma injury. It is the, mo the major organ that really sees the brunt of burn injuries. And burn injuries can be due to um, heat, Electricity, because electricity tends to do is cook and fry the skin, and what we do is called oxidizes the skin. Radiation, certain chemicals, particularly what are called caustic chemicals or exothermic chemicals that actually burn and blister the skin. They denature the proteins and also cause cell death. Okay, um, the immediate threat to a burn is when you lose that epidermis, you are now subjecting the skin to dehydration. The only waterproof barrier is gone or breached. Also, you can lose or gain salts. So any water that gets on that exposed dermis will literally, if it's fresh water, will suck the salts right out of the area uh, to the point where it turns it into you know, a mushy tissue. If you expose it to like seawater, which is two and a half times more concentrated than your own electrolyte balance, it can turn that flesh into beef jerky. And this is the thing about when people die and are thrown into water, particularly if they're slashed up. And I've seen this with animals that were torn apart and ended up dying in the ocean. I get their stinky bodies to do necropsy on. When they died in fresh water, you can tell because the, 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 the skin barrier is gone and, the, and all the tissues underneath swell and become watery. When they die in seawater, it looks like friggin' beef jerky. And also, uh, it affects how the fats get wet too when they die because when the, when, the, when the creature has no breach, the fats tend to do normal things. When there's a breach and an opening, the fats tend to take on a weird appearance in the skin. 
Okay, the problem with this dehydration is this could lead to a loss of temperature regulation, water temperation uh, uh, regulation, and it can cause kidney shutdown. And it can cause circulatory shock. It can actually drop your blood pressure because blood pressure is maintained by water in the larger blood vessels. If that drops, it can bring your blood pressure down below 40 is when the kidneys stop functioning and you can die from uh, uh, um, uremic poisoning, waste buildup, uh, acids build up, it shuts down mitochondria, it shuts down ammonia removal from the liver, and you die usually from multiple organ failure. It also could kill the liver too, and the brain. Now, when we talk about severity of burns, there's two ways of looking at it. The deepness of the burn and the amount of skin burned. Now, usually the surface area or amount of skin burn we can mathematically calculate the type of fluid loss that will occur. So even with a simple burn, you will get fluid loss. But usually with the more extreme burns, we're worried about this. And it's a principle called the rule of nines. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. What the rule of nines does, it looks at a person's body, and she's missing clothing. Okay, and we look at percent. And notice that like four and a half is half of nine. So it just says that... Um, Basically, if a whole leg is burned, you have lost now 9% of your water maintenance capacity. That means you've learned lose 9% of your thermal regulation and your water and electrolyte regulation. That could be a problem. Okay, you look at the face, four and a half. Okay, uh, um, arm, four and a half. Trunk, anterior, four and a, uh, 18%. Uh, groin, 1%. Wow. Okay. And whatever. So all of this adds up. So when you get people to get incredible torso burns, that could be pretty significant. And it's 30%, 36% of the body if the back and the trunk are burned. And I've seen this with steam burns in industry, acid burns with industry, and people in mechanical jobs that tear off chunks of flesh. So this rule of nines is very important in looking at mostly the loss of water regulation. And then we look at the thickness of the burn. And the thickness is related to kind of like first, second degree burns. We keep changing the terminology with this and the significance of it. So, because nobody, again, is there's a big disagreement on how the severity of burn affects you. So now what we just do is basically just say partial thickness burns and full thickness burns. So the typical first degree partial thickness burn means you damage the epidermis only. And there's different first degrees. We can look at first degree mild, first degree severe. First degree mild is you burn off the outer layer of epidermis, which isn't too bad. Uh, first degree severe, you burn off right down to right before it kills the stratum germinativum. So that means in these burns, the stratum germinativum is still there and can recover. It may go into shock, which reduces replication, but it's still there. Technically, what you get is your inflammation, and that allows healing. You get edema, but what happens is the area fills up with fluids and blood because you, you, you increase now irritation. It's inducing a, a um, immune response. You get redness and warmth. Again, skin when it's you know, filled up with blood, it gets warm and red, and you've damaged pain receptors, and sometimes it even overloads your touch receptors a little. It makes the, uh, the pain receptors much more sensitive. It also screws up your heat receptors and cool receptors, your temperature receptors, because what they feel is changes in vibration, and with the skin damaged that way, it makes it a little more sensitive. So you've lost some barrier. It makes it more likely that bacteria can get in, that water and other agents can get through but it's not the worst. The worst is the, uh, than that is now the second degree burn, which now means the upper epidermal is totally gone. You've now damaged the stratum germinative, which means it may or may not grow back. It depends on how much it is. The more surface area of stratum germinative that is gone, it's hard for the cells to replicate and fill in that gap. Because remember, the cells can replicate and fill in that gap. That's particularly not true if the burn is big because then you have to actually have to graft and i've seen people in the industry that have had grafts that they have burnt second degree burns in their body that was so big the stratum germinative cannot fill it in so they have to transplant skin from other parts of the body that weren't burned if the upper dermis is damaged 
you could actually kill nerves that are in there. You could affect sweating and other features. And you usually get a blister. Sometimes with a second degree burn, you'll see uh, a mild second degree burn, you'll see blisters. With severe second degree burns, you might actually see uh, uh, the actual dermis tissue itself exposed. And then we get into the full thickness burns. And this is where now you've charred away the, the dermis. And this is very similar to what I've seen in industrial accidents where people are around sharp machinery and tore off everything down to the, uh, uh, the, the hypodermis. Once you remove the dermis, you now have no skin to replicate. Guys, dermis is hard to replace. Usually what happens, this is replaced now by lower dermis or by the hypodermis, which can only produce scar and scabbing. You now have no water barrier. You literally have no swelling anymore because literally now blood vessels are destroyed. The nerve endings are destroyed. This is the, uh, the, the horrible thing about a person being burned to death or steamed to death is that it, after a while you don't feel pain because you burned. I mean, first you feel horrible pain terrible pain and then you go numb not because of endorphins or anything of believe me endorphins will not cover up that pain because the nerve endings are dead and now you're at the point of no return everything's gone you now have this this connective tissue it has no protective property whatsoever it's just a glue it can't heal because it's it, the, the cells cannot do any type of replacement. We do know that there's no regenerative area left, except maybe we think in the uh, connective tissue that surrounds muscle may be able to actually grow back skin. There have been experiments on that, but the skin, unfortunately, is only dermis and epidermis and not the accessory structure. So that skin will be lacking pigmentation. It will be lacking all the features that develop embryologically. It means the, the hair, the sweat glands, and, and uh, um, apocrine glands, all of that stuff. And this is where usually you need full skin replacement. Sometimes animal skin, sometimes cadaver skin, sometimes a stretch skin of your own. I knew a woman who had a piece of her cheek torn off in an industrial accident, and they took a piece of her butt and put it up there, which is kind of funny. Um, and it was lucky because she had a very skinny butt that was just like her other cheek. And it's really funny because at one time she said um, she used to let her mother-in-law kiss her on that cheek and always told her to kiss there because that was used to be her butt and she never told her mother-in-law that. I thought that was funny and that's something I would do. So third degree burn, man, you are losing a lot of the skin barrier. So you're much more subject to dehydration, infection. I mean, usually these people end up with flesh-eating staph, with, with uh, tetanus, with other clusters that get in there and release toxins. Fungi will get in there, to say it too, but also if you're not careful, flies will get in there and lay their eggs, and it's a total mess. And usually with these type of burns, if you're starting to get it over 9% of your body, you're dead. So this is looking at uh, uh, first and second degree burns, First degree burns, there's redness, sometimes no swelling. Everything's intact, except you might have peeled off a little of your, uh, um, let me do that darker, a little of your um, stratum corneum. Second degree burn, you might, the skin now is really thin because you've lost up to the stratum basale. So you might have a couple of layers over the stratum basale. You might have cooked and fried a little of the uh, papillary layer so it swells and forms a blister and, and it will turn red. And sometimes you'll see pus come in there if there's an infection that took place. If there's a breach, you shouldn't pop that, don't pop it because that allows an opening that allows infection. Uh, uh, and if you are going to pop it, do a small hole, drain it, and, and, and cover it immediately with an anti, with antibacterial, antifungal compound. And guys, don't forget that fluid is there to maintain the healing response. Unless the blister is really going to be a problem, let it naturally absorb. Remember that it's part of the healing process. If you take antihistamines, that slows down the healing because it slows down the process. Now, of course, if it gets out of control, you have to take antihistamines. But if anything, take painkillers. Not opioids, you get addicted to those, but taking painkillers because we're finding out that inhibiting the inflammatory response slows down healing and could make you subject to infection. So this disgusting picture is a third degree burn. And this one is either was due to 
probably not due to a fire because you'd see much more irregular burn pattern. This was probably due to an electrical cord or, or um, a chemical was spilled on them, very caustic chemical. And what the physician probably did was cut away to the living tissue to give that time to accept the graft or heal, at least form a scab or scar. So what you're looking at is even there's no hypodermis. This is something called epimyceum. It's the covering over the muscle, the connective tissue. It's a glossy, smooth covering. And, and if, it's, if there's exposed bone, like if this was gone, you'd see what's called a talus bone. You'll see what's called periosteum. Okay, and sometimes you'll see the coverings of the tendons too. So this connective tissue is not meant to be exposed. It tends to dry and shrivel and crack and eventually expose the muscle. And then once the muscle exposed, the muscle will decay away. This is also very open to infection because a lot of creatures find that stuff very yummy, okay, to eat. Again, there's dehydration going on here. If salt gets on there, it will cause problems and, 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 and salty water could also leak in. Toxins can leak in. And animals will actually try to lay their eggs in there. And I've had, um, a friend who was a physician in the Dominican Republic who practiced in rural areas, and he'd see a lot of this stuff all the time, particularly due to parasites. And there was one particular parasitic infection called Leishmania, that the organism ate the hypodermis away and then rotted off the outer flesh and exposed this tissue. And he showed me pictures of people where uh, the muscle was showing or else the muscle rotted away and exposed bone and the bone was already being rot rotted away. And these people were still walking around. They couldn't afford a doctor or couldn't see a doctor. And, and he would actually come in and treat these people for free, almost like doctors without borders. So this is the severity of it. And, and, this, and, and this is why third degree burns can be fatal. And you have to be so conscious with protecting these people from infections. So to end this again, the severity of burns, uh, um, don't memorize this, but just do know about the degree of burns. So um, burns are critical. If greater than 25% of burn is a second degree burn. First degree burns are so-so. If 10% of the body is a third degree burn, you're in trouble. Okay, so to end this, know where the rest of the biology comes into play with understanding now the health of the, the integumentary system. So understand that nutrition is essential for, for skin replication, particularly for hair growth, for skin growth, for healing. Proteins are essential, particularly for that because skin is very high in protein, particularly collagen. So that means diets high in collagen. One time I used to make people eat uh, uh, um, basically jello made from boiling bones and skin. My mom used to do that. We bone bones, gristle, and skin, and we sometimes chew on the gristle and eat it and swallow it because that's, a, I don't know if that was effective or not. We used to call each other hyenas. Uh, some animals chew on bone to get that collagen. Okay, whatever. So um, particularly you'll see mice doing this as they have a high turnover rate of collagen. Um, so the proteins that make elastin we need in our diet. Okay, we also need a lot of carbohydrates to maintain the rate of skin replication and an adequate circulatory system. So any disease that affects glucose levels, protein, like malnutrition, undernutrition, that affects oxygenation to the skin, that could be anywhere from cardiac to a respiratory diseases to cardio diseases that cause um, blood clotting or elderly, they have um, athero, uh, arteriosclerosis, which, which prevents the regulation of blood pressure. This affects skin, nails, and that whole integumentary system, which means every function of the integumentary system can't work, including the healing of wounds and recovery from burns. So on that note, we covered our first organ system. And we're going to look at some applications of how, again, affecting stuff that we learned early in the semester, okay, impact this.